think you went on this um, BBC show, right? Um, it was like audio only um, show. I think the guy's Tom Holland. He's like the mad revisionist mm. type. Mm. Um, and it's, it's interesting because I think he has a PhD and all that. And you guys are talking and this guy's like total, like, I don't know what his Akida is or whatever, but man, he's he's saying some weird ass stuff about the Dean. And it's just like, it seems like full concocted. Like he's just kind of making up things on the fly and sort of presenting it as if it's like legit. And he probably has done a paper on it. Um, I don't know how common that sort of perception is when it comes to Hadith or... Actually, I'll, I'll get into that a bit later, but what's your sort of thoughts on, on that show and, and Tom Holland in general? Because I don't know, it was, I think it was a while back, to be honest. Yeah, it was a couple of years ago. Um, well, I... Yeah, I mean, if you hear clinking and stuff, it's just because I'm getting teacups out. Uh, it's either it's either a podcast with me doing stuff or no podcast. So that's just for your listeners. Oh, that's so good. Sorry, listeners. That's just the way it works. Um, it's multitasking, mashallah. Well, I'm actually terrible at multitasking, but there's basic stuff I can do, like get teacups down. Um, I think uh, okay, now I'm going to go to another room and I'm going to fold laundry while I talk to you. Um, the, yeah, so basically, you know, he, he's, uh, yeah, I think he has a PhD in classics. I mean, he's actually a very accomplished classicist, um, kind of, you know, Greco Roman stuff. And, um, I know he translated Herodotus or tra- he translated through Herodotus. Yeah. Um, but, uh, anyway, so, but his, his, you know, he's, his perspective is actually quite representative of, um, you know, uh, just a uh, sort of a ori- orientalist view, um, and I think it's you know if if your if if your listeners are interested in this uh, and reading more about it, sorry, I'm just going to close this and put my computer on do not disturb. I'm doing this through my computer. Um, if you if your reader listeners are interested in this, I wrote something which is actually a chapter either nine or ten of my book on hadith, and I basically cut out a section of it with an introduction and I put it on Yaqeen. It's called, I think it's called blind spots. Maybe you can um, find this, just Google like Jonathan Brown blind spots, Yaqeen or something, you'll find it. And it's basically a history of the, the Western historical critical method. In effect, it's a history of how mo- modern Western people came to think the way they do about the past and especially about religion. So what, when we talk about religion, why is it that we always assume that you know, religions are made up, that they develop over time, that scripture is fake uh, or, you know, made up. It, it can't go back to its original, to when it claims it actually comes from, that it, you know, and so you have to understand where that view comes from. And it comes out of a specific, you know, Western European Christian experience with the text of the classics, like, you know, Homer's Iliad and Odyssey, and then the biblical tradition and the history of Christianity, when basically by the, I won't go into details, but basically by the, around the you know, early 1800s, it had become very evident that a lot of the texts that uh, Western Christians and Western people had thought were, you know, authentically and reliably uh, traceable back to their authors in whether the classical Greco-Roman past or the, the, the biblical tradition were in fact uh, either later productions or were um, texts that had come in to, sh- to, to take and form over many uh, either centuries or many decades and had, you know, bore the marks of lots of chefs, right? Lots of chefs were involved in cooking them, uh, cooking the broth, so to speak. And so there, 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 there became this, there, there grew this assumption among Western, especially German and, and, and then later French and British and American scholars in the 19th century that this was just the case for all world religions, that basically all world religions were, you know, cultural productions that took place over time. And there's certainly their scripture, you know, certainly their beliefs and, and dogma emerged over time. And orthodoxy is something that is, uh, isn't, a religion isn't born in its orthodox form, right? It's born in some kind of weird heretical form or what's later considered heresy. And then that is sort of glossed over and reshaped as, you get an organized religion which decides on its its uh, its own beliefs and stuff, and then it kind of goes back and covers up its past and 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 retells its its own sacred history of itself. And that uh, scripture is also similarly kind of uh, massaged and manufactured and edited. 
So uh, the, the assumption is that that's the case for, you know, for Islam. And, and literally, I mean, the, certainly the study of early Islam and Islamic law and stuff really came through uh, as an extension of Western studies of the biblical tradition, of the biblical tradition. Um, because, you know, Arabs were just like another group of Semites that you could study to kind of better understand the, the ways of the Israelites and the, the biblical tradition. And a lot of the people who were the earliest and most accomplished Western scholars of the origins of Islam, like Julius Wellhausen, who died in 1918, or um, the Hungarian scholar Ignaz Goldze, who died in 1921, they they were literally people who did you know biblical studies, and then they just you know as a kind of side job or later career choice uh, decided to study the origins of Islam. So what that means is that uh, you know um, so in in some in one sense you have to understand where they're coming from. And you can see this very clearly with Tom Holland. I mean, I don't, I don't want to badmouth the guy, um, <laughs> but uh, you know, I mean, he, his, you know, he has a certain. You're free range to do so if you yeah, want. But I mean, I don't. On voice in a cage, it's all right. Just, you don't want to be, you know, I don't want to be unnecessarily <laughs> biased or anything. But I mean, if you, if you put it this way, if you watch Tom Holland's videos or listen to him, I mean, he is a an elite British. Um, you know, I, I I call them like tipsy Nigels. I don't know if it's a <laughs> insulting but it's sort of like you know you run into them at a cocktail party and they say well you know i was just reading the latest on Jeshu of the, the royal society and I, uh, I had a very interesting discovery they've made in jordan and apparently the entire quran was written in syria in the year 1300 and then you know these, you know, these chaps they really ought to understand what they're doing is complete nonsense you know so that you can imagine like that kind of you can having that kind of conversation, you'd be like, yeah, yeah, that, that's really interesting, uh, Nigel. But uh, you know, maybe you should lay off the cocktails. But I mean, so the, it's a very, <laughs> it's a mixture, it's a mixture of like cultural arrogance and the assumption that the entire world, except for you, is just sort of lost in the darkness. And you, you know, where you can see this is really like something like Indiana Jones movies, like Indiana Jones, the novels of Ryder Haggard, which, by the way, I love those novels. I'm such a I love Indiana Jones too. I'm such people. I'm such a, like a colonialist or something. I love. You ever read Ryder Haggard's novels like King Solomon's Mines, Alan Quartermain? You know, like a bunch of British people go and figure out that you know there's like some the old the old like cartoon the old uh, you know Tarzan serials they made in the 1940s and 30s and 40s where like these white hunters would go into the jungle and get captured and then they would realize there was a. Uh, they would look in their almanac and they'd find out there was an eclipse happening. So they'd be like, I will make the moon, the sun disappear. And then all the natives are <laughs> dancing around and let them go. So that's the kind you know of You're about to be canceled. You what? know, about to be canceled for um, liking colonial films, colonialist films. No, no, I mean, I, I don't care. I, I seriously, I, I've always, people care. already tried to cancel me before I like Indiana Jones. I, was, I don't, I don't care about that. <laughs> I, I, this yeah, that was my great. childhood, you know, Indiana Jones. Like, I can't, I just can't manage to uh, to find in my heart the disdain for Indiana Jones yeah, after course. how many it's, times it's I watched stuff. Raiders of the Lost Ark. It's six, <laughs> six. That's that's that guy's PJs. Okay, we'll take, so we'll take the the anti Nazi part out of it and just leave the rest. You know, we'll just be quiet. Wait, so you this. you don't like the anti Nazi part? And no, now no. You're I said we'll, we'll, I meant yeah, I meant I meant we'll, <laughs> you're gonna get canceled. <laughs> Gee, so what someone's you're gonna crop is, that. So what you're I, saying? I, is, Wait, yeah. I want to be very clear. You're not saying you like Nazis. You don't like Nazis. No, like no. To be clear, yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. My, my my grandfather was thrown in jail um, for being a partisan and, and fighting against the Nazis. So, uh, not to say in, that that necessarily in Italy. Means, you're, you're the. Are you the Italian yeah, one? Yeah, I am the Italian one. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes. I remember there was. Uh, I think that you oh, like you were chatting with Mahin on the Man Mamluk's podcast. Uh, and was this, there something about how I didn't wake up on time for an episode? And then uh, I remember you just briefly said, "Oh, is that the is that the Italian guy?" And so someone sent me that and said, "Hey, look, do, uh, Dr. Jonathan Brown kind of knows who you are by name." Yeah, because we of. talked about the leper. <laughs> we did. Anyway, yeah. the point is, you're, you guys are distracting me. The point is, we were talking about uh, Tom Holland, right? So he, you have to yeah. understand this perspective. It's in one sense, it comes out of a. A tradition's realization that its own its own origins are sort of made up, right? And that that and then they just assume that's true for everybody, and that they are going to go and kind of help everyone around the world free themselves from this art of this prison of the past. You know, why are you going to be a prisoner to this to these weird, you know, uh, bogus religions that you follow when you can be enlightened 
and Western and, and, you know, maybe not even Western, but don't be prisoners to your own past. Right? So that in one sense, like you have to understand that, you know, one could call that a, an altruistic or a, you know, quote unquote, enlightened perspective. Uh, but then part of it also comes from colonialism and the, you know, when you conquer mm. the entire world, you automatically assume that you're in a position to judge those people and tell those people about their own lives and their own tradition. Right. So, uh, that that's you you have to understand the perspective of uh of these of this scholarship but that's really what there's not so there's not too much of that now in islamic studies and now islamic studies and and middle eastern studies and religious studies i think has other problems it's not so much a western centric sort of uh, orientalist problem as it is a uh, now it's more of a deconstruction and and kind of progressivization and uh, activize, activistization of scholarship that where everything is it doesn't really matter what's reliable or true or good arguments anymore. It's just a matter matter of what fulfills certain sort of social justice agendas. But the the yeah anyway. So let me finish. So I, sorry, I keep don't don't get me uh, on another tangent, or you won't. Well, it'll, the same thing will happen that happened last oh, it's time. It's a good tangent. It's all right. It's all right. Yeah. So but, but then the, <laughs> then so you have so then. What we, a good way to understand this is that the idea that religions change and that scripture is not as it couldn't be, couldn't have sort of arrived in its original and lasting form, that it had to go through some kind of editing, significant editing process. This becomes essentially an article of faith. It's almost an article of dogma for uh, Western scholars of religious traditions. And so they just assume, they, 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 they assume that it has to be the case that the Quran. Uh, was not did not actually come from the time it says it comes from that it has to have undergone serious change over time, and so they'll concoct whatever bizarre argument or chain of of argumentations they have to to arrive at that conclusion, even if it means ignoring the best evidence, right? So a good example of this is with Tom Holland with his. I wrote an article about this. Is in his book, The Shade of the Sword. He says that, you know, the Muslims basically got the five daily prayers from Zoroastrianism, and his argument was that, you know, so of course, you know, they say, well, Muslims don't write, don't we don't have early Islamic history written down. It's only written down, you know, in 150, 200 years later at the at the at the, at the, the earliest. But you know, so how we have to go and figure out what their original version of their religion really was? Where did they get this stuff from? So he says they got it from Zoroastrianism. What's his evidence? His evidence is a, I think it's a 12th century Jewish text from Spain, which turns out actually to be partially fraudulent anyway, and that's discovered in like the 19th century. But it's a 12th century text from Spain, quoting a an 8th century rabbi in Iraq. Okay, so m- mind you, remember, what's Muslims' problem with their history is that they didn't write their history down for, let's say, 150, 200, 200 years. So how do we solve that? We go to a guy in Spain in 1200, so fully, you know, 600 <laughs> years after Islam starts. But but it's okay because he's quoting an earlier figure from the 700s. Mind you, if a Muslim quotes an earlier figure, it's not allowed. But this guy's quoting this this rabbi from the 700s, who says what? He says that when Muslims, uh, when uh, Zoroastrians convert to Islam, a lot of them didn't start stop drinking immediately. Okay, fine, whatever, you know. <laughs> This, this is not new, but it has nothing to do with the five daily prayers. Nothing. So, you know, this whole, what is this? Sorry, there's no evidence for this. And and yet you have in the Muatta, which is an early, you know, one of our earliest surviving texts in Islam from the, the, the late, you know, the mid 700s of the common era, right? It talks about the five daily prayers. So you have, you have a, you know, there's a Chinese traveler, I think, who is a, in, in in Kufa and Basra in the 700s, he talks about the Muslims go to pray five times a day. So you have all sorts of evidence, which is reliable historical evidence that Muslims have these five daily prayers. But you know, and and but he's insisting that it comes from Zoroastrians, even though his evidence actually doesn't even talk about the five daily prayers. So this is this is an example where the thing is that oftentimes these kind of Orientalists and neo-Orientalists are asking you to believe about the origins of Islam with whatever theory they've cooked up, what they're asking you to believe is actually far harder to believe and far more of a stretch of even a secular imagination than just believing that the Quran comes from the mid-600s in the Hejaz 
And there was a guy named Muhammad who saw he was a prophet, right? Like, you know, whether you want, you want to believe it's revelation or he was a real prophet, that's up, that's up to people, you know, that's people's choice, right? But the fact that these, this actually comes from the time and the place it says is not an insane thing. You know, it's, how, how bizarre is that? Especially since we have, I just got in this debate a couple of days ago on Twitter. I couldn't believe it. There's, by the way, Muslims need to stop watching this crap. I don't know what is, do Muslims have like no taste or no discrimination in what they watch on YouTube? Because I kept getting contacted by these young Muslims who are like, oh, I just watched some guy, like a video on YouTube where he spends an hour talking about how Mecca, Islam actually started in Petra and Jordan and not in Mecca. And I was like, oh, why, yeah, did you, why, uh, I was like well, why did you watch Patricia this stuff? Patricia Crohn's thesis. Yeah. yeah, I was like, no, that's not even Patricia Crohn's thesis. Sometimes. That's not even, yeah, yeah. this is, th no one b believes this nonsense. Okay, there's a, in fact, there's a really good scholar from an Israeli guy named Michael Lecker wrote a review of this thesis of this book and just trashed it i mean it's viciously true i mean he was polite but it just he just torpedoed it completely the point is that you know we have i i said look there's non-muslims books by non-muslims written in the 660s the common era the 670s 680s 690s where they literally talk about muslims have this shrine in arabia in mecca and they say the muslims in different parts of the world pray in this direction toward this place, right? In the Hejaz. And they say that the Prophet Muhammad lived there and he traveled from there when he was a child from to, to Syria and tr on trade and things like that. And, uh, you know, so my point is that not only do you, let's say you don't want to believe anything Muslims write because we'll say Muslims are unreliable. Even non-Muslim sources would show you that this religion or whatever, this movement originated in the Hejaz in the mid seventh century. Anyway, so that's that's my response to, to this to this stuff is that you have to understand that it's really about um, getting Muslims to adopt a certain cultural attitude towards uh, towards their religion and joining, you know, in a way, kind of quote unquote, joining the rest of the world in realizing that religions are human human creations. I'm not advocating that by the way i'm just telling you that's what the, the program is firstly i'd like to clarify to all our listeners that i'm not a nazi yeah um, that's a poor really turn of phrase yeah i mean it's really not what you want to be um at the moment uh or ever no, really. you guys do pretty well in the u.s now <laughs> i'm just saying yeah that's it this is like uh it's the time to come out and and embrace it in, over there it seems but um I was gonna say, uh, yeah, I was. It was just like Husnadon of Indiana Jones. Like, let's let's take out from it the lessons of anti-Nazism <laughs> and and leave the rest of the kind of Not only that, know, colonial he gaze. Helps, he helps that village, the starving Indian village. Remember, he didn't have. <laughs> yeah, to help yeah, that's them. it. He, he wants he to help the children. <laughs> Yeah, I know it's a little bit white savior. And he wanted fortune and, and yeah, exactly. fortune and glory. Fortune and glory. That's all he and, wanted. Uh, yeah, and then and, and the kids Stay run out. In the, end. the kids run in the end, and they're so happy, and they, all the Indians get their kids back. Because if he was a real colonizer, he would have taken those stones for himself and put them in a museum in London somewhere. Everyone knows that. Yeah, but the so. shades, you know, it's like a... <laughs> Shades of clay. It would be. It would be right now in in the in the. In well, the remember if you see if you see um, if you remember from Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade, he does want to put everything in museums. Remember in the beginning when he's a young yeah, guy he played actually. by River Phoenix, uh, and uh, he um, the late River Phoenix, and he says that that's the cross of Coronado. It belongs in a museum, and then the guy says, "You lost today, kid, but you don't have to like it." <laughs> that's a great scene. That's I feel I feel left out. I grew up on Bollywood, so you didn't watch, you I didn't watch, watch my. Yeah, I watched a lot of Shah Rukh Khan, so I was in it. Uh, but even that, like, I think there's like shades of like I don't know. Even like all kind of um, you know Bollywood and Hollywood, they have that essence of you know the white savior sort of mentality in both. Because I remember even like there was the good Muslim, bad Muslim tropes in even Bollywood. So it's like it, it's all of it exists. You know, all the Bollywood char all the Bollywood Muslim characters look like like they're just like evil Molana characters, you know. Like you, yeah, you have and to all know. the Muslims are terrorists. All the mu Muslims in Bollywood or movies are like terrorists. Most, most they're, of they're, them, they're yeah. criminals. They're not always terrorists. They're, they're usually criminals, I think, or they used to be. In yeah, there's a lot of like, gangsters uh, as well, like Agni Pot and things like that. And 
Oh, he knows. <laughs> yeah. I, yeah, I remember the shark. I'm a big uh, Bob. Well, I, I like some of the movies. I like Malika Aurora. <laughs> I remember um, Shah Rukh Khan played like one uh, Muslim guy. I forgot the ra- Rays. He was. He, I'm like, I, I go into a movie theater. And he's like, yes, there's, he's finally playing a Muslim character. Oh, but then, then first scene is like his Shia and he's slicing his back. I'm like, oh mm. dear, like this is not the representation no, that's, that's, I needed. Uh, that's yeah, that was actually. And he was like, his, he was a um, alcohol seller as well, or something yeah, like, or, or a was, drug yeah. dealer. So yeah, that that made me a bit sad. So. Maybe you want to go visit Gujarat though. So like, like, it looked like oh, an interesting place. Yeah. But yeah, I was gonna um, just moving swiftly back. I think another <laughs> another thing I was reading the other day was about the early um, the early battles fought by the Muslims against the Sassanids and the Byzantines, and it's so bizarre to think that the Muslims didn't have the five daily prayers when there's literal you know sources which um, describe the Byzantines figuring out that if they could attack at Fajr. Yeah, but you have to understand this is were... it's not about. Like you during the Muslims' prayer, they actually identified it, 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 that. It, you know, kind of Orientalist and Neo-Orientalist views is that any Muslim source that goes against your theory can just be discounted as being made up later, right? So this is just made up by Muslims, right? Because to cover up the fact that allegedly, quote unquote, they got the five daily prayers from Zor- Zoroastrian. I mean, which, by the way, I mean, remember, it's not like it's the Quran says. That you know, like Kutiba Siyama came Kutiba Ladina in Kublikum, right? So like, we know that there's, at, like the Hajj, the Hajj is pre-Islamic, right? So there's all sorts of things in Islam that come from tradition before Islam, but mm-hmm. once it gets affirmed by the Quran and the Prophet, Lay Salam, that's that's Islamically legitimate, right? So what this guy is saying isn't that Muslims had, you know, that their religion incorporates aspects of religions from before Islam. What they're saying is that. After the death of the Prophet, that Muslims were like, you know, went out into the Middle East and they were like, oh, oh we don't really got any prayers. Um, hey, these Zoroastrians are doing this five daily prayer thing. Why don't we do that? That's basically what they're saying, which is ridiculous. Yeah. Uh, the, another name that often came up when uh, I actually did a, um, I think back in first year of my undergrad, uh, about early Islamic history and Orientalists, and, and two names that came up were Fred Donner and Patricia Crone. I actually read. Patricia Crone's, uh, I read, I think I remember reading the whole book, um, Mech and Trade and the Rise of Islam. Mm-hmm. And, uh, I remember being struck. That's not actually by, a bad book. No, but I just was struck by how f- sort of flippantly she dismissed Hadith as a, as a, like, how can you describe the Muslim tradition without mentioning first and foremost, the fact that Muslim, because she basically says all Hadith are, are, are stories. Um, yeah. used to elucidate the obscure meanings of of the Quran because she accepted. I'm fairly sure that she accepts the Quran as like a historical source that could be dated to the time, mm-hmm. um, but that it was so sort of obscure even to the Muslims and the Arabs themselves that they uh they would you know sort of create these stories which would become the the Islamic tradition and Hadith. But how can you do that without mentioning the different? And sort of hadith critic, early hadith criticism, hadith scholarship, categorization of hadith, and that was the first thing that struck me. It's like you haven't set up the Muslim sort it's of easy. position it's, it's to easy, refute easy, it. Easy. It's easy. Sadly, it's an easy answer. Mm. You know what it is? And, mm. Muslims aren't serious people. Right? Muslims, Muslim scholars are not serious. They, they don't. They don't take Muslim scholars seriously. They're just. You know, un, 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 unaware, naive pawns or participants in this manufacture of attrition. And then, of course, the great irony, this is what I consider the real great irony, is that whose books are these scholars using to do all this? It's not like there's other people who are collecting material besides Muslims. This is all they're, all, they're using material that Muslim scholars collected and sifted, painstakingly categorized, preserved, even if they didn't agree with it, right? And then, I mean, my, my favorite is this one Dutch scholar who's, whom I won't mention, but uh, he died of, I think, 2014. Um, well, I might as well mention him. I'm going to talk about it in my books. Uh, Yoinbo, G-H-A, Yoinbo. Uh, and he was, I actually wrote about this in my review of his book, but he, you know, he, you know, essentially came to the same conclusion as, as Krona, that, you know, Hadiths are just completely unreliable. But he, the irony is that his, he, really used almost exclusively as his main source for navigating everything and coming up with his arguments, 
this book by uh, Jamal al-Din al-Mizzi, Tuhfat al-Ashraf. And Mizzi died to 742 Hijri, 1342 of the Common Era. And, you know, the guy was literally using the, if you re- look at this book, or even any of the books of in this genre, you're like, I can't, I can't even keep up with this book, let alone can I imagine, I cannot even imagine writing this book now with a computer and searchable databases. These guys wrote these books with, with nothing, right? Just, you know, paper and their minds. And they, these books are in, incredible. I mean, they're, they're incredible. They're just stunning. And to sort of you, to, to be sort of leaning so dependently on that crutch, not even leaning on it as a crutch, but it's literally the, the, the seat you're sitting on to do your work that you're using and to be uh, just entirely dismissive and contemptish, contemptuous of that tradition. That strikes me as, as uh, there's something fundamentally, uh, I, I would almost say dishonest or, or unaware to the point of, of dishonesty, it's more of culpable, culpable um, neglect, you know. And okay, you know, look, I have no problem with people doing critical studies of Islamic history. That's fine. I have no problem with this at all. But don't, you know, acknowledge what Muslims did. Acknowledge your debt to them as you do that. It's very simple. What do you make of um, someone like Fred Donner as well? Well, he was my teacher. I, I love Fred Donner. I mean, I think he's a wonderful person. And I think he's a great scholar. Um, you know, he when he, I was actually in his courses when he was writing his Muhammad and the Believers book. And we had lots of debates, you know, with his students about his theory in the book. I don't agree with the book's theory. Uh, and I said that to him. And he was, uh, this is what I'll say about Fred Donner. He's an ex- extremely fair person. I mean, professors are oftentimes like borderline psychologically unstable, usually on some kind of spectrum. And uh, the... And they can oh, really? Very, is that, no, is that, is, sorry, no, just they, to add quickly, it's because even with my experience, like, because um, my um, uh, major is finance, funny, but anyways, I, I all my kind of um, elective subjects, I made sure I did it in like humanities or, or philosophy or arts or et cetera. And I've generally had like pretty good experiences with all my philosophy well, yeah, professors, all fairly fair, fairly fair, fairly fair and all that. In grad school is different. Okay, in what what yeah. way <laughs> can, can you explain? Because I mean, it's like, just what... you, you know you're you're spending a lot more time with these professors, and they're they are you know you're potentially a competitor to them. So my uh, whole point is to say that, that uh, okay. you know that every Fred Donner is not like that at all. He's you know you could sit there in class and say, you know, I really don't totally disagree with your theory, and this is why I'm going to give you you know A B C D points. And he would just say thank you. He would just be very sociable and and pleasant about it. And he was very fair. And so we had lots of disagreements about his theories, but he was always uh, a very supportive advisor. He was my advisor, a very supportive professor. And um, I I really benefited a lot from him. And what Um, do you think was the crux of his like sort of theory? Yeah, for people who don't know um, or aren't familiar necessarily with his work, could you summarize it briefly, the idea of the Believers Movement? Uh, He wrote a lot of books, but his his latest book, I think it's his latest book, is Muhammad and the Believers. And if I I remember correctly, his theory is basically that Islam starts out as the sort of kind of apocalyptic ecumenical movement of, you know, everybody is like, believe in God, the days of God are coming, the end of the world's coming, and and so you can be Christian, you could be Jewish, you could be whatever, and you can kind of just get on board of this, this sort of belief in God movement, this apocalyptic movement. And the, the identity of being Muslim as a separate identity really only forms, I think he says in like the, the time of Abdul Malik bin Marwan, so roughly like, you know, 690s to seven, early 700s. And, uh, you know, I, I had lots of disagreements with him and other, other people have, have um, noted problems with this thesis. Um, and I think the the best examples are come from the Quran itself. And we would say, like, what about this verse where it says, you know, we're Muslims, or like we're the, you know, and we're the Muslimin, or like we're some Mahu Muslimin, things like that. Um, or the fact that you can't just be. There's no, as far as I know, there's no evidence in the Sira that we have or the Quran that you could be, let's say, like Jewish. I mean. Like some like Abdullah bin Salam is Jewish, right? Tamim Adari is Christian. These people are, but then they meet the Prophet. They decide they want to follow him, and then 
they don't just keep saying the prophet doesn't say like, you know, okay, Friday is now the day we're going to have our communal prayer. And they don't just say like, well, you know, that's really cool. We think your religion's awesome. We're feeling it, but you know, (laughs) we're, we're still going to do Saturday or we're still going to do Sunday as our days of worship. Like you can't, you, at no point does anyone actually say to the prophet, challenge his religious opinion on an issue of like faith and practice without, if you do that, you're out of the movement. You're not Muslim anymore. You can't, the prophet lays out some defines what Islam is as a religion. You can politically disagree with him about, you know, should we stay in here and have a siege or should we go out and meet the enemy on the battlefield? And people can have a debate with the prophet. Lays out Islam doesn't care. But in terms of like when it comes to deciding like what the, your beliefs are and your, your worship, there's no evidence that you could, you could say, no, I'm still part of this other community. And so we would have these debates and, you know, and I, and over and over again, it, you know, whatever evidence you'd say, he would just say, well, I think this verse might be added in later. And so then I said, well, this is problematic because, you know, your, your thesis is, in, is, is based on the idea that the Quran is an early document, which we're going to use to make arguments. But then when evidence goes against your argument, you say, well, I think this verse might have been added later. So that you can't win in this situation. It's, uh, it's, it's um, you know, loaded uh, or whatever. Rigged, rigged game. So that's uh, that's my. But it's been a while since I looked at the book, so I don't want to mischaracterize it. You, you might want to get someone who's read it. I, I had a random thought because you just brought up like the time of Christians and, and Jews at the time of Prophet Muhammad so, so, um, You know, uh, I know it's a bit of a tangent, but I want to get your thoughts as well. I don't think you've. I've heard you speak on it, but there's sort of um, uh, an interpretation by some. Like I've actually seen. Um, I think uh, I've watched some videos of, uh, I think Ben Abrahamson, um, he's a rabbi, I'm Jewish, on, on YouTube, and I think I follow him on Facebook as well, where it's like there are a faction of, of Jews where uh, a, a, poten- a percentage of Jews that actually see, I don't know how they view Islam, but it seems like they view Islam as a truth, but they view it as for just the Gentiles, if that makes sense. And so um, they actually go by the sort of um, line of thinking where um Judaism is for the Jews, so the Jews have to keep following their law, and Islam is for the Gentiles, and I guess that's how they get salvation. But they still, I guess, essentially treat themselves as a uh, a, a, a special sort of group, but in that sense, they don't dismiss Islam. They sort of accept it as well, if that makes sense. And they actually, um, I forgot, some of the sort of um, justifications were pretty interesting in the sense that they would say that um, uh, Deen isn't, Sharia, so they can follow the Jewish um, law, but they're not sort of, I guess, rejecting Islam either. Like they're just going and following their law. I don't know if you've heard this sort of take because some people, um, I don't know, may may get confused on on what Islam's sort of position is on that. So, have you heard of this line of thinking before? And and what's your thoughts? Uh, no, I, I've never heard of this. I mean, I'm not oh. saying it doesn't. I'm not, I'm not <laughs> saying it doesn't exist. I just haven't. I just happen not to have heard of it. Uh, so I, I can't, I can't comment on it. I want to.